if you follow me on social media or you read my newsletter, then you've already heard me rave about today's guest. Today I'm speaking with author John Andrew Bryant about his new book, A Quiet Mind to Suffer With, which is out later this month. I'll be sure to link it in the show notes. Uh, and I have to say that this book is like nothing I've ever read before. It's beautiful, it's heart-wrenching, and I hope that everyone who is listening today will pick it up. I so enjoyed this conversation with John, who also has a theological background. His book, A Quiet Mind to Suffer With, is the story of his experience with OCD and mental illness. It's a very personal look at how his faith has kept him anchored and centered while he has dealt with OCD over the past few years. Regardless of your own experience with mental health, I think John has something to say to each and every one of us about the impact that Christ's death, his rising, and his coming again has for the suffering and the brokenness of our lives. Thanks so much for listening. This is Outside Ourselves. I'm Kelsey Clumbera, and here's today's episode. Hey, John, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Glad to be here. We were already chatting a little bit before we hit record, and I've been, I feel like, probably gushing about your book because i it's so far one of my favorite things that I've read this year. Um, and I've seen, I think I've seen this in a couple other places, but it's definitely a, uh, the book that you've written, a memoir of sorts, but it's deeply theological it reads i think in some places kind of almost like poetry um so i don't even know exactly how to describe it and i'm curious if you could maybe give us a description what what is this book a quiet mind to suffer with um that you've written how how would you describe it to people yeah i i think um at a very basic way it's a it's a memoir about um, recovering from uh, the worst symptoms of OCD as as a Christian or as someone who depends on Jesus to get by, which is kind of mm. some of the language that I use. Um, the The first 50, 60 pages are sort of like a map of the journey that I was on, which kind of reads like a theological essay or kind of my friend said it kind of read like a sermon, which was not my intention, but, <laughs> but it's certainly kind of a map of where I'm taking the reader, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and then the, the next, the next 200 pages are, are the journey. So there's divided up into three sections. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. So Christ has died is my breakdown. Hmm. And sort of uh, just a very powerful um, reintroduction to the gospel uh, where the Lord sort of really made it very clear who he was going to be in my life. Um, and and Christ is risen is about getting better and, and how hard it is to what we mean by getting getting better, which yeah. which I think is a is is really a term we have to be careful with because my symptoms didn't get worse, didn't get better. They got worse, but I was getting better. And so it's, it kind of felt like the wilderness years where you're learning to live without some of the consolations you've had in your life and learning a new way to to get by. And and, um, and then the Christ will come again is, is sort of this promise of joy, which I yeah. think for people with OCD is, is the ability to be fully present in, in your life. Um, and to sort of be reacquainted with the goodness and gladness of, of your life, which if you live mm-hmm. in your head, it's just not a place you feel like you're ever going to get back to, but it's a yeah. promise that the Lord, the Lord will get us back there. The Lord intends to, to, uh, to, to give us his gladness. And so there's signs and signs of that I felt already in my recovery, but that's sort of the way the book works. I, I call it a, a memoir of a spiritual journey, maybe I, it's certainly about yeah. what happened to me, but different genres, certainly. And it gets really does get into poetry mm. at times. Um, my language is pretty, pretty lyrical, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and so it can be, 
And my friend said, I don't know what to make of this book, but I like it pretty good. And I said, that sounds fair. That's, fair. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great endorsement. Maybe <laughs> yeah. the best endorsement. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so, it's, deeply personal it's very your language is lyrical and i would say very intimate and you kind of talk at the be the more of the beginning of the book of the struggle to decide um whether it was worth i think going back to some of those hard places in order to write about it and to to share it um can you talk a little bit about about that struggle and that decision why did you decide ultimately to write this book because i can imagine it in it was very difficult in in some places yeah it was um it was tremendous it was tremendously hard um but then i think hard in in a good way or a, a joyful way i think what happened is, so my and i keep an anniversary of my uh, sort of breakdown, which is on mm -hmm. October, will be about five years ago. And well, it won't be about it, it will be five years ago. And um, pretty soon, I was in um, a, a psych ward for three days. Um, and um, that experience was so pivotal uh, for me, for everything that came after. But I, I think mainly what happened is pretty soon after coming out, I, we pastorally, I was working at a church. We had lots of young folks who were having breakdowns, not the sort that, that required what I needed, but were similar enough. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and what was happening was I was feeling the Lord. He did never made me share, but I, there was things about what I experienced or was experiencing that when I started sharing them, they, they immediately felt as if they were becoming a way by which the Lord wanted to make himself known to other people that we loved. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and I think, I think the biggest thing was learning to not be ashamed of the symptoms of, of my illness. Um, yeah. the worst part about the, of having a mental illness in my experience is the suffering you can deal with. Not, not everyone can, but the suffer it, it's not as hard as the shame of, yeah. of saying, yeah, yeah, I, I, I I had a breakdown. I had to go somewhere. I had to, I had to be out of life for a while, but yeah. um, we were finding that people that we loved were just, it meant the world to them to hear mm -hmm. what happened to me and where I met the Lord in it. And, you know, you, you think to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm in my late twenties and I'm talking about a psych ward visit. What is this going to do to my career? What is this going to do yeah. to, prospects I had uh, uh, because I want to be known as a normal person who has everyday struggles, but not the kind of ones that land you here. Yeah. And at some point it just didn't matter. We were, there were people who were in crisis, who were receiving, it was like, I, I, I knew, I knew the distress and I could recognize it and, and I could be present in a way I hadn't before because I knew what it was like to fall apart like that. And I wasn't afraid of them or what was happening to them. Yeah. And, um, and I knew that the Lord met me there and I just being a sign that the Lord meets us in those places or can. And, and um, it just seemed like it was that had more to do with what life was about than sort of safeguarding my honor or reputation as someone who wasn't crazy or didn't have a breakdown. Um, and so when I was writing the book, I was like, yeah, like who, who wants to write about this? And then I was like, but the Lord met me here. Um, my ministry now is with people who are there all the time. Yeah. And, um, and I think a part of it was just, I guess it, it felt like the story was a means of grace. The Lord was willing to Absolutely. use our testimonies to reveal himself to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking back on it, I'm, I'm never, there's times I, I wished I would have been more choosy about how vulnerable I was going to be in the ways I was going to mm -hmm. be vulnerable. But uh, coming, people come back to me and said, you know, that I made all the difference just knowing someone else had been in a place like that and, and, yeah. and, and could be a sign that Jesus will meet us in places like that. So I guess that was like the redemption of it. And also just, I loved writing. I loved writing so much. And yeah, 
and I was, I, the more I worked on it, it turned into an essay to a book link thing. And I just thought, I, you know, I, I don't care. Hmm. I don't, and you lose that like part of you that cares and makes negotiations with yourself. I, I don't want people to know that. I just, somehow it just dropped off a bit. And I just said, I've written this thing. And I think the Lord, I'll just be, I'll be honest, the type of OCD I had, the suicide rate is really high. Okay. Um, I've never, you know, that's never a place I had to arrive at, had lots of suffering, but this, the, the, the type of OCD, the suicide rate's really high. And just the thought of mm. someone reading it and, and not, and not going that down that road, I just felt like that's, I'm, I'm going to do that. That would be, that would be a meaningful thing if, if it would, if it would be a help in that way. So yeah. I guess that's, <laughs> no, I guess that's, that's... kind of how I thought about it. Um, I mean, that's amazing. What a gift to share your suffering, knowing it's at some point causing you more suffering, but um, in sharing it that you're joining someone else in theirs. I think that's pretty powerful and beautiful. And you're right. As much as we want to talk as Christians um, in theological terms or in what should happen or, you know, plans, sh just sharing stories. I, I found in my life, that's always the most powerful way to help someone out or to be there for someone, um, is when you are willing to just be open about your own, your own sufferings instead of trying to approach it from an abstract place. That's important, I think sometimes, but, um, when it comes to actual people like li living life it's yeah. so much more often the 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 stories that i think make the difference for sure your um your language in the book i found so interesting you you kind of use these very vivid um i would say physical descriptors of for your ocd to me it felt very physical, these descriptors mm -hmm. that you're using for a mental situation. Yeah. Why was that important to you? Where did that kind of come from? Was that something that you felt, um, even some of the terms that you use, you have a whole glossary of these, these yeah. terms in the, <laughs> of the book. Uh, were those terms that you came up with as you were writing this out and processing it, or were they already terms that you had, um, in place from just experiencing OCD and your breakdown. Yeah, I was, I was making terms uh, up as I was going. One thing I was finding is, um, if you have, uh, a mental illness can just feel overwhelming without, without words and, mm. um, and people who care want to know what's happening to you. And so that can put a burden on the person who's experiencing it, where they have to describe yeah. what's happening. And a lot of it just feels indescribable and just like torment. And, and so a chaos that, that sort of just takes away meaning. And so there was a sort of desire to at least have language for the experience. And I found a lot of OCD is actually pretty easy to describe. It's like both not mm. and it is. So everyone's had a car alarm going off when it's not mm. supposed to. Right. And it can be really distracting. And so, um, and initially and I said, well, it's like, okay, like pretend my brain's a car and I have a car alarm that never goes off even when everything's fine. And it's like, how would you, what would you do? And you were like, well, that would be really distracting. And I was like, yeah, it is. It's really, really distracting. And I was like, well, I guess I would, I, how do I turn it off? And I was like, oh, it doesn't turn off. Like it's, it's just, hmm. it's always like that. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and he's like, well, how do you, I guess you just learn how to drive the car anyway. And I was like, yeah, you do. And there are, you know, ways to do that, ways to learn how to just act as if everything's fine when there's something that's not fine or that's something that's sounding like it's not fine. That's where the idea of the siren came yeah. into, into yeah. being. Okay to say, okay, like we, we all kind of know what that's like. Um, and so that's enough of what this is like to, I think, be helpful 
Yeah. And I think also people know what it's like to be trapped in their thoughts. So one of my phrases was the realm of ceaseless cognition. And everyone, mm-hmm. I, I know people who, who, are, who just, you get lost in your thoughts, but also people who, I think there's this desire in every person, especially in our day and age, to, to say, I'm going to think my way out of this. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I, and, and I'm going to figure this out. And, and that actually is what got me into the psych ward was, was not, not my obsessions, the obsession side of the OCD. It was the compulsions. Mm-hmm. It was what I was doing. And if your obsession, if your compulsions aren't like checking doorknobs and stuff, if, it, if they're in your head, you don't actually realize that there's a difference between what your brain is sending out to you and what you are becoming involved with, with by a compulsion. So I didn't actually know. I just thought, I thought everyone's head was that tangled and busy. Yeah. And, and I thought everyone sort of spent that much time ruminating. I didn't realize that, that that's by and large not <laughs> a, a normal experience, or at least the heaviness of that. And, and so trying to unravel, to come out of that felt like leaving a place of bondage or, yeah. or I took a lot of res- it resonated a lot with the story of, of being delivered from Egypt. Uh, mm. this place of bondage, place of, a place of slavery. And, um, and I'll be honest. I mean, the hardest thing is to not go into your head and make things right for me because yeah. not doing that means facing full on that car alarm going off in your head. And, mm. um, cause that's the, that's the, that's the thing is the siren says, well, if you can figure this out, I'll stop. And so then you're like, oh, I'm going to figure this out. So the car alarm will go, stop going off. But it never, it's never enough for the yeah. car alarm or the OCD. It's always just, it's going to keep, it's going to get louder. And so I was finding these ways of saying it that were helpful to me and they were helpful to other people. Mm-hmm. And, and it, honestly, the, I mean, to reframe recovery from OCD as a spiritual journey where, you know, the Israelites weren't necessarily feeling like they were doing better once they got out. They were, yes. the will, they were like, I want to go back. I want to go back. This, I can't do this. And, and to face life without the compulsions, you, or the compulsions you've lived with for 30 years, yeah. it's just so tremendously hard. Yeah. Um, and so that was like, oh, that's, that's a lot like the wilderness for, for them, just this daily bread, the sort of like facing things, the sort of dying to self or just, the, oh man, the, the, the things that were consolations I have to are now being taken from me by the gospel. Mm. The gospel's taking my consolations and giving mm. me Christ instead. And I just, it's like, it's just so tough. Yeah. And I think, I think for people to understand, I, I, this is what I tell people that are, have OCD. I was like, when you stop your compulsions, that's when you really, like, like you hit a wilderness where your brain is so unhappy about your decision to not give into your compulsions that, it, it becomes really painful. It's a lot of, it's a lot of suffering, but I think the ultimate idea is like, okay, out of, out of the compulsions through the wilderness of the symptoms themselves, the siren blaring and into a promised land where just these signs of just like, okay, joy is possible. Gladness is possible. Yeah. Like I, by the first time I was able to be fully present in a conversation with my wife again, I was just, I wanted to cry. I didn't think that was a possibility. You didn't, you mm. just don't think you're going to get out of your head. And, yeah. and maybe some people can't, cause I don't want to hold out false promises, but with, with my OCD, if I was willing to accept the wilderness of the symptoms without the, the compulsions, hmm. I could gradually make my way back into my life very painfully, but it was worth it just for those moments. And I think that, journey took on a physical length, the interior, what was happening in my mind was taking on in a physical sort of journey from like journey out of, out of the realm of ceaseless cognition through the wilderness of symptoms to the promised land of being present in your life. And it's at sometimes it was a little hokey, but it was so helpful that I was like, I don't care if it's yeah. hokey. Yeah. Like I'll call it a wilderness and sound like an idiot. I don't care because that's what it's <laughs> like right now. And, yeah. and so, I, and a lot of my friends, I mean, looking at the idea of like, I'm going to write a memoir and create a glossary of terms and just <laughs> something about it just sounded so like dumb and, and, and prideful of like, oh, here's some terms you've never heard of. So I'm going to list them out for you. But my friend said, well, no, you've created, 
this immense sort of coping strategy and, mm -hmm. and story. And, you know, you're, you, you're, you're trying to give us access to your, your quirky way of working through things. And, yeah. and so I was like, okay, let's go with that rather than like, you know, to, I don't know, something's felt. So one of my editors, like, we need a glossary for all these terms you're creating. I was like, oh. <laughs> who starts off I, with a glossary? <laughs> yeah, you know, like, oh. I found it very helpful. I didn't <laughs> think it was, it didn't come across that way at all to me. I, okay. I was like, oh, we're, we're going to have some, there's going to be some new <laughs> unpacking of images here. That's great. <laughs> You've just been talking about, I feel like what I picked up on as a major theme of the book. And that's this idea that trust in Christ doesn't always equal feeling um, happy or feeling the way that we want, right? Like trust in Christ is not, it's not always perfectly equated to, to feeling. And, and sometimes even it's, <laughs> it is a feeling and it's immense suffering or immense pain. Like you're saying, can you talk a little bit about that disconnect and that discord and how you've um kind of worked through it you did you you did kind of just talk about it a little bit but i'm i'm curious to to just hear your thoughts on on more of that yeah there's a real i think a painful divorce that has to happen i that had to happen for me between what i was thinking and not in terms of me thinking but the thoughts i was experiencing and the feelings that i was experiencing and mm that those things were not the final word on me, yeah. that, that um, there was a trust that could be renewed, recreated through the proclaimed gospel that actually was, had more to do with who I was uh, or had the final say of the matter of, of, of who I was going to be or where things were gonna, what life was gonna be about then, mm -hmm. then the, and I think, I think my generation, I think, I don't know what it is and I, people, I don't want to get into why, but I, we just put so much trust in thoughts and feelings. Yeah. And I had to make a painful divorce between, you know, if you, if I wake up with my intrusive thoughts, I can't let that be reality or, or make me feel like I'm, you know, worthless and horrible because the intrusive thoughts are really just a symptom of an illness. And so, mm -hmm. but so are the feelings of distress that come in. So then you're like, well, who am I? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And and I think that's what the trust answered this question of just like when Christ reveals himself through the proclaimed word, then, you know, if he's the one who offers mercy, then we're the ones who receive it. And, and mm. it became this beautiful little foothold to say, well, I'm the one who needs mercy. So I must exist in some way outside of these thoughts and feelings, because here I am getting up anyway. Here I am having a day anyway. So I, I must be located somewhere within this call and response where the Lord can summon me, can summon that trust again to, to be involved in my life. And hmm. so I, it was a, it was a really strange experience. Um, and, and what happened, what I began to feel myself as was just this person wandering through a wilderness or mo more often actually a person swimming through a storm the storm was the symptoms, but it was such a blessing to be the one swimming through them because I thought I was the symptoms. I, I thought I was that chaos. And I was like, yeah. no, 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 you're the one swimming. You're the one hearing the the, the Lord speak and, and being pulled back into what life really is. That's, you're that small trust. That's you. And yeah. I was like so relieved because I was like, oh, I thought I was that. And they're like, no, no, you're actually the smaller thing of the Lord gives you mercy. You're the one who receives it with, with hands outstretched. And that's actually more to do with you than, than what you're experiencing right now, because your brain's not your friend. Man, that was such a healing thing for me hmm. to, to yeah. find that, you know, I, I say humility is just, is just the Lord revealing who he is to us. And when he re reveals who he is, he reveals who we are and we're servants and guests of his mercy. And, that's a better way to live than trying to be a God, fixing your thoughts and fixing your feelings and making them the right thoughts and the right feelings. It's just an, an unwinnable game. Yeah. And, um, yeah. That's interesting. There's, there's a humility to separating ourselves from whether it's mental illness or 
whatever our struggles may be um, to say like, no, that's not you. This is like you said, I think you said you're something smaller, but that's such a, such a beautiful and, and good thing. I never, that's a really beautiful way I think to think of humility in a way that, I don't know, sometimes I think humility gets distorted because of like the humble brag. So when we talk about it, we actually end up thinking just about pride. Um, But I, I I love that description. That's really helpful. On the show and with 1517 the organization I I work with and that the show is under we talk a lot about grace grace comes up a lot the gospel comes up a lot but I noticed that um in a quiet mind to suffer with you most commonly uh refer to mercy Mm -hmm. is there a reason that you've found mercy to be a more helpful or relatable a uh, gift of God's for those with mental illness or just for you specifically yeah. um, as compared to maybe grace or is that just, I'm, I'm curious why um, the theme of mercy was, has, has been so prevalent and helpful for you. And maybe and I thought about that, you know, I, if, and I, I'm not, a, you know, I, I hope I got enough of my seminary background to, yeah. to toss around, you know, differences and, you know, yeah. the mercy as the Lord's steadfast love and something about or the, you know, his loving kindness, but just the, the accent on that his mercy includes his sort of full involvement in the human mm-hmm. arena and, and the laying down of himself um, and this sort of an offering of self, um, yeah, somehow that, you know, and, you know, I, I wouldn't sit there and go, Oh, it was, it was his, it was his grace, not his mercy or his mercy, not his grace. I just, I was like, what is the word for me that communicates that the Lord offered himself for us? And that mm-hmm. offering is, is what makes the difference. And, and yeah. that when he offers himself, we are changed. And I, I guess the picture is just that sort of involvement. And, um, but I, you know, I, maybe I thought mercy sounded better on the page. I don't know, no, but yeah. I've, 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 you know, I was like, what do I mean by mercy? And I think I, well, I mean, his steadfast love that and verse, a, a steadfast love that gets involved and makes things right. Mm. And that, and is a, it is a gift, the gift of himself to, to gods and strangers to make them servants and guests. No, I think that's, I mean, that's a beautiful description. And you're, I think the, the involvement of Christ in suffering, um, the sacrifice and, and uh, offering of, of Christ and suffering seems to come up a lot mm-hmm. in, in this book in a way that I, I was, I've been thinking about this all week as I've been reading um, your words. I think sometimes that whole process or when you say something like that to someone, it can kind of, it comes across as strange, of course, because it is strange. Um, but it almost can come across as abstract until I think a person has experienced suffering themselves. Like, I, I don't know, how I'm I'm curious how you feel about that if you've had if you have any thoughts on that but it seems to me like um and maybe even mercy as well until you're actually in in suffering these these words can come across as abstract and they can kind of go in one ear and out the other but there's something about living through the experience that makes Christ's experience of that for you, very, very real. Did you, have you found that to be true? Yeah. Um, I, you know, struggling, I've struggled to figure out, um, the relationship between what I, I suffered, which felt intolerable with, yeah. 
a Lord whose whose mercy was revealed through it, revealed in it, revealed mm-hmm. anyway, redeemed in it, redeemed it. I, I really, yeah. and I think I just, um, you know, I really, I go back and forth. I, my theology is big on, on revelation. His, mm. you know, his laying down of his life reveals who he is to us and, and who he's going to be for us, what we can't be for ourselves, what he's going to offer in the place of what we can't ever really offer him back. Yeah. And I think what's hard is suffering just appears as if it's a total loss. Like it's a loss yeah. of meaning, a loss of a loss of those things that give meaning. And I was like, okay, then what? Then why is our why is the picture of uh, you know why are these these vivid pictures in Revelation of the Lamb slain and why did cre- why did Christ keep the scars? What what is he saying about him bringing the you know the still crucified now risen Savior in heaven before the Father? What's going on there? Why why keep uh, why keep those things? Why um, and I I there really wasn't any answer I found. Ex- I, you know I work with a population of people who suffering isn't meaningful, mm. um, and so I have to you know and I've seen people mm. who aren't better because they have OCD. I I think I'm better at least in terms of I feel like there's something about having OCD that's been a strengthening of my faith through Christ, but, but I've seen people who are so devastated by the illness that they're not better. And then I have to go, well, what do you mean by better? But (laughs) right. um, There's just so much suffering that doesn't seem answerable. And then I just, and I had to question, it's like, well, somehow the Lord, the Lord's bought the broken body, the, 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 the pierced hands are, him taking responsibility in his own person for those things that we really don't have answers for those yeah. moments of suffering that really don't feel like they, they make are going to make sense. They're going, you know, when we take the Lord's supper, that's the sense that's made is, you know, Christ has died somehow in that, in his body that we take is this weird answer, but the answer mm-hmm. is himself, not mm-hmm. it's himself, not the same as, you know, his, his answer was never, we're going to get rid of this for you. Uh, you're going to be OCD yes. free in, in seven weeks. You know, it was five years of just the symptoms abiding, but my faith being still operative, still still growing slowly by his means of grace. Uh, that, that distinction, I think, you know, keeps coming up as like, we're not promised, we're not necessarily promised healing in this life. It happens and we can give thanks when it does but um what he does promise us is is himself uh in bread and body and in word um and in the fulfillment of his promises which you also kind of um do such a beautiful job of of bringing up this this hope in Christ who ha- who will come again that's you know the last mm-hmm. how you title the last section of your book what what difference has that specific hope made for you and how do you because I know that you um you've already mentioned you minister to people now with mental illness is that something that that you bring up with others often or you know at the at the right time Mm -hmm. but how specifically does that hope of of Christ's return um play a role for you in recovery and in uh dealing with with OCD you know, I think it's it's a relief that that you know ultimately the Lord's going to have to come back. I think a lot of us think like, okay, Christ has died. Now my turn, my turn to do the stuff. <laughs> yeah, and and that sort exactly. of active engagement. And I, there's a lot of it. I, I mean, I'm not saying don't be engaged, but a lot of it. And I guess you would call it an overrealized eschatology. I guess or mm-hmm. get the word, but just a lot of maybe naive energy put into like, well, okay, well, now that this is true, we're going to go and like, we're going to like be the church. We're going to be the church. And I don't want to demean a phrase like we're going to be the church, but I always just like, well, what do you mean by that? Because yeah, in my mind, 
and I, I, I feel like I err on the sign of cynicism. I was like, the gospel, the gift of the, the proclamation of the gospel and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of believers, this crucial means of grace, physical, audible, you know, um, it really matters. We're going to grow in faith, hope, and love. But like, what are we talking about? We're going to end these things. Like, I'm not saying don't be active and engaged, but like, if I walk downtown where I work with the thought just of just like, I'm going to help people. I was like, no way. We can be a small sign of what's true. And I think mm -hmm. the summation of that is like, Christ will come again to say the final amen to the work he's done to gather his people, cast out darkness, to mend all wounds and to cleanse all pride. He's going to do that, which just freed me to have an ordinary day. I think <laughs> it's just like, yeah. all right, let's <laughs> learn how to be a friend again. I lost yeah. a lot of friendships, not like because people hated me. I just wasn't keeping up with folks. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. let's learn how to be a friend. If we're not going to save the world, like how do I, how do I just have an ordinary day and being gentle in ordinary ways, calling people back who called me because I don't know, like you should call people back that you care about <laughs> or, or at least ask for forgiveness when you can, right. you know, and, we all, we all, and I was like, man, it's ordinary life. That's where these, this gospel is working. At least I'm seeing. And, mm -hmm. and then I was like, well, what happened to my big plans? You know, that I ever think I was going to change the world or, what hope do I have of people getting better? I, I don't, I don't want to decry social movements of good and or mercies, mercy ministries at all. But I was just like, Christ is going to have to come back soon. And, and, uh, and until then we're kind of have this holding pattern where yeah. we have patient endurance, um, standing, taking, just being able to withstand the forces that, are trying to destroy God's people, but, hmm. but not, I don't know. I, who knows where my thought, if my theology, where theology should lie, but I, I, there's just a lot of positivity that I've never understood even before I had a breakdown about what we were going to be doing as Christians in the world hmm. and what was going to be possible. And, yeah. but then I don't want to limit God at all and what he can do. I, I sound, you know, I want to sound no, like an angry old man, you know, like. I don't, <laughs> I don't think you, I mean, I, I don't think you sound that way at all. I think there's, um, a, I think a, a touch of cynicism, especially probably for like millennials is probably, um, good at some level, but I, I totally relate to that. We're going to change the world mentality. You have to, as a Christian, have that mentality um kind of you know having that inserted into my head as a kid or a teenager or whatever and the freedom that comes with knowing like you said jesus is the final amen he's coming back uh the freedom that comes with that is that you can actually go and do some good and yeah. that doesn't mean you need to measure it and it doesn't mean it needs to be um world building or world changing, but it can be as simple as calling a friend back. And that's pretty amazing because, um, that's, that's where we are and that's where he's, he's put us. And there's a passivity to, I think the Christian life that we all, we tend to just scoot over very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, that's really important to to remember and to, to hold on to, because it's important to remember we're not, we're not in control <laughs> of saving ourselves and we're not in control of saving others. So I'm right there with you. We can both be old, <laughs> old grumpy men together <laughs> if we need to be. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. The most touching moments in your book to me were your descriptions of people who cared for you while you were in the psych ward, you describe an older nurse, and then you have um, some really beautiful passages about your wife mm -hmm. as well. But you also write about how so many of the people that were there when you were there didn't have that. They didn't mm -hmm. have anyone coming to visit. Um, what what impact do you think that that, that really had on you having 
kind of those those people in those moments um, of connection. And I'm 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 kind of guessing, but would love if you uh, you know say yes or no to this or talk a little bit about it if you're comfortable. Uh, do you feel like that experience has had a, a part to play in what you're mm-hmm. doing now and the fact that you um, you kind of, I think, I believe are probably acting as that connection for, for many people. Yeah, for, for being um, as cynical as, as I find myself, I, I tend <laughs> to throw myself into dark corners of the world. Mm. Um, but, but with a very limited sense of what I can be, you know, I go see a yeah. friend of mine in, in a really bad place it's not bad as i mean, like there's not a mistreatment it's just a sad place to end up if you're if you've got an extreme mental illness you're not a danger to yourself but you can't take care of yourself um mm. and we go and uh you know the, the smells and sounds are hard you walk in and it's just it's just tough and um mm. and it is, it is true i think and i don't think there's conscious evil but the, the places where we don't want to look end up being places where we don't have to look so this is a, 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 a facility where you don't have to you're not going to find it unless you want to find it and you're not going to yeah. these people aren't going to be seen unless you go find them and but we i go and we sit i you know we we uh we shoot the breeze uh, we go on a little walk um i've known him for seven years i see him not often enough um mm-hmm. um and you know we get we get a my dad called it a cake and a coke little snack from the snack machine just these little little decencies to say like what would you like like what would you like to eat like what would be fun do you like pepsi do you like mountain dew and mm. but then we sit out in the park and there's a little park area um and uh and we listen to michael jackson and dancing queen um we listen to music from his child, just stuff he wants to hear. And we'll sit there, eat our chips and listen for about a half an hour. And, and then I say, well, let me walk you back and I'll see you next, you know, and, and for, and like somehow that feels like hope to me, like, or it just feels yeah. like, okay, we can't, I can't reform this institution, but I could go see somebody yeah. and try to see them regularly. And, and that's what happened to me. I, if, if that, old nurse. I call her old nurse. She had a name, but I didn't, I didn't remember. I wasn't going to use her real name and somehow just the descriptor of, of old nurse, but she walked with me. She did, you know, uh, if you're, if you're sick, I'm six foot seven, if you're six foot seven and you're in a psychiatric facility and they give you these ridiculous gowns, you just, you know, I I wouldn't approach me. I was like, well, she, (laughs) she walked right up to me and she said, something along the lines of like, well, here you are, you know, like, and in a gentle way and just like, hmm. and, or I was like a law and order SVU is on, which is like the only thing on, <laughs> on psychiatric facilities is like law and order SVU. And then like maybe later Dr. Phil and, <laughs> and, uh, and she was like, do you like this show? And I was like, no, she was like, well, do you want to go on a walk? And I was like, yeah. Hmm. And I had this little book of, and just non-invasive questions, but present like questions of presence, just like, yeah, hey, like I like that's a that's a cool little Bible. And I was like, yeah, they let me keep it. What she did was she gave regard to me in a place where regard is just not given. And and if there's anything in my ministry now that is the crucial, I think most important thing, and I tie it theologically to things about the atonement and forgiveness, is you know the Lord's willingness to turn His face toward us. Yeah, needs to be matched by our willingness. If if we, you know, the the means of grace, I think, point us back to the world and say, look at the world, give it regard as it is. You don't have they don't have to agree with you before you're willing to look it in the eye and say, and say people's names. And that's what she did to me and hmm. for me. And um, I, I be I meant the world to me that my little pocket ESV. You know, my wife coming to see me and she like read Psalms and and just reminded me that I had a life outside of this and, and, uh, that I had a name, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, to have someone call your name in a place where like, no one cares what your name is, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And, and I was just looking around and I was like, okay, it's me and this one other guy who got people coming, you know, this, this is the difference to me between, between making it and not making it is these, 
small moments. And I think that's what I, you know, I could go on for hours about this, but I'll just keep it short. But I think what people don't understand when they're dealing with some of the mental illness is you don't actually have to know all the stuff about their mental illness. It's helpful to mm. know some things. What the main thing I tell people is if you're talking to someone whose mind is not their friend and they're, it's an, they're experiencing an affliction, but that affliction creates suffering. And there's these losses that don't, that are hard. If you have, if you're, if you're just living and I talk about the three unbearable losses, the loss of honor, the loss of security and the loss of meaning. Hmm. And I said, actually, you know, those losses are just part of being human. So going to somebody and just seeing them, regarding them, you're, you're, you're a sign that the Lord is going to clothe these losses. He's going to clothe shame. He's going to, he's going to, Hmm. to, uh, to uphold us. He's going to give back meaning. Hmm. And and you're just a sign of that just by being present. You're, you're a sign of the, of what the, of, of the Sabbath rest truly promised in Christ. And I said, it's more than enough. I mean, regard is huge and it's the thing missing in lots of ministries. I was like, Hmm. how we do ministry with people matters. Being rough with people is worse than just not doing anything at all. Like we might, like sometimes, not all the time, but yeah. um, But I, it it meant the world to me, and I would call it the sacrament of presence, or uh, you know, her decision to turn her face toward me, her decision to uh, to speak my name, to felt very close to um, uh, just the sign of, the, of Christ's goodness and his mm. turning his face towards me in a way that I'm always trying to get language for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I th- my cynicism, I hope is, is matched by this thing of like, man, the, the things we can give as people who've heard the gospel and are led by the spirit, let's give those things, these yeah. small little small graces to pour out on the world as it is. Yeah. You know, I think we can, it's hard, but I, I think, that's where vocation stuff comes into me. And yeah, it's, it's the heart of what I do now. Yeah. 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 At one point you say nothing has disfigured me more cruelly than my dependence on myself. And I think that that need to be saved from dependence on ourselves hits everybody, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's dependence on thoughts or feelings or our abilities. And I think this is, that's why, you know, that, that kind of sentiment and that theme is why you write so much about the gospel being audible and being something that's um, heard and from outside of ourselves coming coming to us, um, which, you know, this podcast is called Outside Ourselves, so I loved, <laughs> loved all of that. But you also, I found it really interesting that you uh, – you describe that so vividly and so well. And yet you also have a lot in the book about the quietness of, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's in your title, the quietness of Christ, the quietness of the gospel, um, or maybe even being quieted Mm -hmm. by the gospel. Can you talk a little bit about that distinction between um, hearing and the auditory uh, characteristic of the gospel and yet also it's, it's quietness? Yeah, I, I, the you know the the main temptation with my thoughts is to speak back to them, hmm. um, and I you know and I look I I'm not saying there's not a time and a place to speak back to negative thoughts, but with OCD it's the it's like some of the worst things you can do because yeah. you're 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 pouring cognition on top of cognition to create a firestorm of of compulsions and ruminations and. And I just remember being walking down the hallway of the psych ward thinking like, I'm going to think my way out of here. Like I'm going to hmm. figure this out. And, and I think when we go, I, I, I've really pride to me has taken on this really sad, but understandable way. I think about it is it's a, how are we going to recover losses? How am I going to get my honor back? How am I going to get my security back? How am I going to have a fulfilling life after this? Um, and the idea of pride is, is it's that thing in us that says I can, I can make up for losses and I can make things right. Like mm. I can take back what's been lost. And I think anytime, yeah. I mean, 
anytime I feel myself like want to, you know, have a smart retort at somebody or, you know, I guess they call it clap back, you know, this, this thing of just like, <laughs> oh, you said this, well, now I got something. There's always a sense of like, I'm making up for a loss. Someone has, whether imaginary or real, like I've, some regard has been taken, some honor has not been given, and I'm trying to make up for it with this sort of retaliation. Hmm. And it's so human, but I, and at the base of it is this thing of like, how am I going to be okay? And I think those are real needs. Like we really do need to have some sense of, of like regard and some sense of security or some sense of purpose to function. Right. I think the question is, how are those needs going to be met? And pride says, I can, I can make it happen. I, I can yeah. get those things for you. And it's you mm. talking to yourself, you know. And I think the thing that I felt from the Lord at that moment was, I think quiet for me is is not so much, and that's why I need to be careful, not so much that like my interior world is is without static, but it's the it's it's the passivity to not engage in a in a compulsion. Yeah. Okay. And to accept the moment of suffering or distress as as painful, but not real. Mm -hmm. And I think that came from a sense of like, because Christ's work is finished, there's nothing I need to do to be okay. But there's mm -hmm. something I can hear to remind me of what's been done. And yes. And so I think that sort of saying like, okay, I, I can't, I can't fix this. I can't, f I can't renegotiate honor, security and meaning in the middle of this like all i have is the promise that christ died on the cross for my sins gave himself to me and that i am okay hmm. and i think it didn't create this immediate sense of well-being but it created i think the possibility of, of simply receiving or of just standing in that yeah. promise and for me that it, it took on a physical element of just i would just you know, I, I reach out my hand for the bedpost that was wooden and imagine um, that I was at the cross. And I go back and forth on like, should, what, what role does the imagination play in our spirituality? And I'm, I'm not, I'm not mm. really big on it, but sometimes you have, so I just had a sense that if the Lord died, then I could be at that place where he died and I, I wouldn't have to do anything to be okay. I'm just going to, that was just going to be me being okay. It was being, being at the foot of that cross and yeah right. yeah that's there's the the quietness is is a gift from the the word spoken it's almost like the gospel sh can have the power to shut mm -hmm. everything else up whether it's the cognitive you know struggle or the thoughts that tell us we are our own god and that we are saving ourselves through x y and z you end the book talking about something that really helped you in your recovery was finding rhythm and i think you talk about three three kind of rhythms or gifts that you would partake in um and i'm forgetting that i know it's prayer and offering i'm forgetting the first one um yeah, was, uh, can you talk to us hear about, prayer. Oh, go ahead sorry hearing that's right of course, yeah. Hearing, praying, and um, and offering. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you mean by those, and also kind of mm -hmm. what you um, what that rhythm was like for you as you as you were recovering and and um, coming back into normal life? Yeah, I had. I mean, I've. It's been. I call it that. I had. 2000 attempts at the same kind of day. And what I meant mm. by that is I had mm. years to figure out like how I like how I, I just had this sense that I, I either I find a way, which I maybe sounds worksy, but find a way to be with Christ or I'm not going to make it. Hmm. And, and I think figuring out, I think the rhythm is just was, you know, and it's, it, it was based off the daily office from the Anglican Episcopal world, just, you know, these set scriptures and rhythms. Um, but the hear, pray, offer thing was, was to say, okay, the foundation of my day is, is going to have to be some sort of way by which I recommune with the crucified Christ by the proclamation of his gospel and the fresh 
reception of his forgiveness. And so it was yeah. just like, or the, or Christ has to reveal himself again today by hearing or else like, yeah. I'm just not going to make it through mm. without like having a really hard time. And for me, that was, and I think hearing again, is just that passive rece- receiving right. of the proclaimed word rather than me sort of negotiating a righteousness. It's like, okay, let me hear again who Jesus is. Whenever I feel like I can't pray, I go back to hearing. When I feel like I can't really offer myself where I'll go back to hearing. I was like, Christ hmm. has to reveal himself through the scriptures, through the proclaimed word, through the through the Lord's Supper. Some There's got to be some way this guy is going to reveal himself to me again so that I can begin again as the guest of his table and then um, or a sinner at his table so that I can learn to be a guest at his table so that I can learn to serve his table. But I think the, the rhythm was this question of like, if, if these are mercies, if like his dying and rising are, are these events of himself that he gives to us, then what does our life at his table look like? Like effort is happening here, but I don't feel so much as if I'm doing stuff so much as I'm being sort of rescued and led into a new reality and like letting right. myself be rescued. And I think that's what is hard to communicate is like, in my experience, like the Lord rescues my trust. When he rescues my trust, he leads my trust. When he rescued and rescues and leads my trust, he gives me back to the world as an offering yeah. to reveal him. And so this yeah. sort of, and so trying to say, okay, it's, it's actually, you know, like I'm hoping pretty pragmatic. There's like, how is the Lord going to find us? Well, he's going to have to speak to us and, mm. and then, and resurrect that trust. And then once he has it, you know, I say the gospel, he resurrects his trust. It's by the spirit. He, he the gospel, the, 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 the trust he rescues, he leads by his spirit. And like, and then like, mm. we're supposed, we offer these things by which the Lord gathers a people to himself. So fellowships in there too. And I, mean, I was just really trying to figure out like, how does daily life work with this guy? I have to receive him, stay with him. Mm. I need to work with him. But everything always went back to receive him, uh, receive his forgiveness. But I, I kept going back to the thing of, you know, feeling not only that I had been rescued, but the Lord was tugging on me. Let's get up. Let's have mm-hmm. a day. Um, there's these small moments where the direction of my life felt like it had a leading or the spirit was leading it. And that's something I wouldn't have ever said that I experienced like that. I'm, I'm sure I had yeah. moments, but I just felt there was this sense of like, how do I, how do I get through the day? And these small offerings, all right, work on this, like call this person back. Like it's almost like the gospel and the Holy spirit had to sort of consecrate these small little things I could do. It's like, okay, John, mm. why don't you sit down for an hour? as someone who's just heard the gospel, as someone who's made the attempt of prayer, not not a mm-hmm. great attempt, but someone who's <laughs> sort of uh, asking the spirit to lead, well, what will you do today? And it was like, well, I'm gonna do the dishes or like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call back my mom, you know, or or I'm gonna sit and, and, and write this email I've been dreading, but and it was so chancy. Like I was just like, reality still made no guarantees that I was going to get better or things were going to work out or I was going to be a productive citizen, but I still felt mm. like I was being pulled back into actual living somehow. Yeah. yeah. That to me is, you know, in some ways a description of God preparing and knowing the good works he has for us um, in, in a recovery like setting, you know, and it continues for you now I'm sure and um plays and that and that is true for for all Christians everywhere in in some sense but I I think that that's beautiful and I think your reminder of the need um well and just the reality you found of the need to go back to where he speaks and where he gives himself to us over and over again as the starting place is the right orientation to have because we we do it backwards more often than not probably um i know i do where i want to do instead of sit in here and i want to go and i want to be productive rather than um 
going to where he's he's promised to be. So I think that that's a beautiful reminder. I'm sorry if I cut you off. I think I feel like you had uh, you were. I just maybe else. would would echo just that it's it's pain it's painful, and I think that's where I yeah. wasn't expecting to be so challenged that, you know, I can't, I talk about that, you know, people talk about mercy and judgment in my joke is I, I think I said, I think mercy has enough judgment that for <laughs> us in the joke is just like, because mercy reveals our need of it. Like the Lord dying yeah. reveals mm-hmm. that the Lord needed to die for us. Right. And I think mm-hmm. that's a, that's, there's a pain there. And I think having your constellations, having your dependence on yourself taken from you by a gospel that can cleanse our pride by reapplying you know, the Lord's goodness and his forgiveness and his death. Just that active sort of sense of like, I, the Lord's doing work here, but it, but it's painful. And, but the pain is that my pride is so attached to my sense of being okay, that I feel like I'm not go, I'm not going to be okay because mm all of a sudden my ways of being in the world are being taken or, you know, I I keep going like, did the Lord take it or was it surrendered by to the Lord? And I, you know, but I, I believe that, you know, we can come to him and be changed, but that changing is, is painful to have your, your ways of being in the world, to have your pride revealed to you is painful to have. Mm -hmm. And since pride is so deeply attached to like, how I'm going to recover these unbearable losses. You feel those losses for the first time. You're like, Oh no, how am I going to be Mm. secure in my life? I, I've just, you know, in repentance and forgiveness said, I don't want to live like this. And now by gospel and spirit, I'm living without at least have some taste of living without that compulsion or whatever, but it's so painful because now I'm really afraid or I'm actually feeling Mm. fear for the first time or I'm actually feeling what it's like to trust in Christ instead of firing off my mouth at somebody who said something. And what I'm feeling Mm -hmm. is like, Oh, it's humiliating to just receive an insult and to not fire back and to be able to sit in that and say, actually, there's something more important than getting that loss back. And it's like, I believe Jesus is going to clothe this, this loss. It's just painful. And yeah. And I wasn't prepared for that. I guess you call it sanctification. I don't throw some words out, but like, <laughs> like, it's just so, it was so unexpectedly confusing and disorienting to say, okay, actually being okay is going to look like receiving his mercy and not like the things I'm used to doing and growing in that gradually yes. by his means of grace yeah. is going to be painful. Mm. I just wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> prepared for that. Yeah. I'd been to seminary yeah. and everything. I still wasn't prepared for it. I'd written papers on it, on it and wasn't prepared for it. I think that's what right. was so deeply surprising as I thought I, I thought I got it. And I was like, oh, I know I don't got it. And uh, (laughs) yeah, 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 yeah. The reality of of God killing our sin and putting us to death and raising us again is uh, a lot harder than it is to talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) For sure, (laughs) it's a lot easier to talk about it and and write about it and theorize about it than live it. Live it for sure. Um, man, well, I, I'm just so thankful for this time. This has been such a great conversation. You, you said you have no, no platform, but is there anywhere people can follow you or should we be on the lookout? Are you, are you working on anything else or writing anything else? Yeah, I'm writing, uh, another book. Um, it's about a lot of the things I talked about, uh, with the visiting folks. Um, it's about ordinary okay. hospitality as, um, and sort of where it comes from and, and what its function is in a world that's not going to get better just cause we care, or at least yeah. not in the ways we hope all the time. It's going to be about regard is what it's going to be about. Regard's been the fruit of everything I've, I've done in this. And it's come, mm. if I don't, if I don't hear the gospel, I can't give it. And so that's what the way I think yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if people are, you know, I do have a website, beaverfallsstreetpastor.com. It's, I live in Beaver Falls. That's My right. job is titled Street Pastor. There's a description of what I do, um, a blog I, I semi keep up with. That's the kind of only platform I have. But if you go on there, you'd be like, oh, this okay. guy's, this is what he does. This is his thing, I guess. <laughs> that, that's the only. Other than that, hey, I'm just. You have, uh, you have a platform. You have it. You got I, a know, I just, 
<laughs> yeah, I guess I got a website. No, but those two things, <laughs> working on a book and then staying at this okay. work and and trying to awesome. trying to cultivate these little third spaces, places of hospitality and hard environments. And that's the work. Thanks for letting me be well, on thank here. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So excited for, for people to listen. Thanks so much, John. Outside Ourselves is a 1517 podcast. To learn more about all of our shows and all of our podcasts, please go to 1517.org forward slash podcast. If you like today's conversation and you haven't done so already, please subscribe to wherever you are listening or watching. If you're watching on YouTube, I have a lot of new content actually coming out on our YouTube channel, um, both shorter clips from episodes as well as original thoughts from, from me. So I hope that you will subscribe there so that you don't miss any of that content in the future. We will see you back here in a couple of weeks.